so good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chamberlain, and uh, thank you so much, sir, for granting us the opportunity to be uh, uh, to interview here, uh, you, uh, sir, here at uh, the showroom of uh, Volvo in Shanghai, sir. So my uh, first question to you, sir, um, because right now we focus a lot on AI and 5G, sir. So uh, can you tell us a bit about, you know, uh, what, you know, how popular is 5G in China right now, sir? And uh, normally, which sector does China use this 5G the most, sir? Okay, so 5G launched back in 2019. Yes. So the technology is now five years old. Um, in terms of popular, I believe the numbers are roughly 40%. So 40% of Chinese mobile subscribers are using a 5G service. So by that measure, it's extremely popular. Now, that's on the consumer side. One of the things about 5G is the technology was built both for consumers and for business. Yes, so in addition to 40% of all customers using it, um, we have at least 30,000 5G private networks. That's 30,000 companies that are using 5G to help automate their business. Uh, that's a huge, huge number, and it's far larger than any of the other countries that we see. So normally, for example, the, uh, the, the, the car industry, the, the factory industry, all, most of them are, are pursuing 5G right now, sir. I would say it's all over the industry footprint. Uh, we see lots of manufacturing, they're using it for uh, things like AGB. One of the benefits of using 5G over a competing technology like Wi-Fi is the reliability of the signal. So if I have an autonomous guided vehicle, one of those automatic robots running around my factory, if that robot hits a Wi-Fi dead spot, it tends to shut down and you have no way of doing it other than sending somebody out to reset that robot. When we replace that Wi-Fi network with 5G, we get full coverage and the robot will continue to operate um, for the entire production run. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, back to Cambodia a bit, sir. Normally, you know, Cambodia depends a lot of agriculture, sir. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we also jump a bit into industry. Right. So right now we kind of, you know, mix between the two, sir. For example, we mix agriculture and industry together, making it agro, uh, agro industry, sir. Right. So if Cambodia were to uh, introduce a 5G or, you know, maybe AI in some areas, sir, how would we approach that system into agriculture, sir, let's say? Okay, so when an operator is looking to deploy a technology like 5G, yes, uh, they would look at the types of cell phones in the market right now. And looking across Cambodia, I would see that the cell phone penetration for 5G devices is really low. Um, so there's not much of an incentive to deploy it to offer high-speed broadband to consumers. On the other hand, one of the services that 5G provides is fixed wireless access. We call it FWA. This means we're using that mobile signal to deliver broadband to homes. And for that business, I think it's absolutely perfect for Cambodia. Do you have the option of running a fiber line to every house in the country? I think a lot of people in your country don't have a choice for high-speed broadband. If the operators in the country deploy 5G, we could be delivering um, 100 megabits of data to their home every second. And that would help them do things like working from home, and uh, online conferences, online learning classes, um, uh, remote training. There's all kinds of functions that are possible uh, with that home broadband service. And Such as maybe the use of drone, you know, over large farmland, something like that. Sir. Well, over yeah. farmlands, one of the interesting projects, I was working with a team in Algeria. Uh, they're using a combination between 5G and uh, AI um, so they can detect um, uh, diseases within the crops. Uh, they were looking specifically within the potato crop um, and using a smartphone at first and now they're trying to migrate that to drones um, so they could automatically identify the diseases when they're early stage and then do spot treatment on it so you don't have to blanket the whole farmland uh, with chemicals. Um, that's just one of the technologies we've seen helping make uh, agriculture more efficient. Um, another thing that we're seeing uh, and this one just goes back to connectivity. If we have those farms uh, with a good mobile connection, 
then the farmers could literally pull out their phones and start promoting their products and their crops uh, to people across the country. And that changes the economic prospects for your farmer because they no longer have to sell to a distributor that comes to them. They could start distributing their crops to everybody in the country uh, and helping grow the revenue for that village uh, quite substantially. Yes, sir. So basically, 5G alone, when talking about agriculture, we can focus about you know, how to uh, spot the disease, how to uh, you know, distribute the, the crops, supply, business to business in, in agriculture. So 5G opens a lot of ways for only one sector, but in, in many ways, sir. Right, exactly. Um, but one thing I will emphasize, even basic connectivity like 4G uh, can substantially improve the life for farmers. Um, for example, if I had a smartphone which has access to online weather reports, that is quite useful to farmers to help them maximize their crop yields. Um, if we knew what the weather patterns were like, uh, we can plan accordingly uh, and grow crop yields. So just even basic 4G service with connectivity in remote and rural regions uh, is really, really important uh, for their economic development. So in this era, the speed of the data is, let's say, everything, so let's, yeah. I wouldn't say the speed of the data is everything. I would say the connectivity and the reliability of that connectivity is essential. Once we have that connectivity, then there's some applications where that speed becomes everything, and we want to push that. Uh, if we're using that mobile network for home broadband, then we definitely want all the speed we can get. Yes, sir. But, you know, I mean, um, 4G or 4.5 or 5G is, uh, I mean, you know, it's a very innovative system. But at the same time, sir, be before we can make it happen, we need facility. And, you know, some people say 5G is more like exponentially more expensive than 4G and more complicated to run. Is that correct, sir? And, you know, for, for let's say, an economy like Cambodia, do you think 5G is, is ready in, in which area, sir, let's say? So, it's absolutely true that a 5G antenna is more expensive than a 4G antenna. Yes. Um, it's also true that it's a little bit more complicated to run the network. Um, and that is driving demand for automation within network operations. But that's just in purchasing the antenna. If we look at the cost of delivering data to consumers across the country, it's the other way around. Because remember, a 4G antenna can deliver this much data. Yes, and it's going to consume a substantial amount of power. A 5G antenna is going to deliver this much data for that much power. But so, over a, a shorter distance also, so let's say. No, oh. same distance. Same distance. So one of the things that Huawei was pioneering on is pushing the technology called Massive MIMO. Um, this is where we're using multiple antennas, uh, antenna elements to work together to extend the coverage of the beams. Uh, and because of that technology, we're able to have a 5G antenna with the same range as a 4G antenna. Um, that was one of the design principles we're very proud to have achieved. Yes, sir. And uh, at the same time, so for example, how about, you know, uh, the prices? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when telecom companies, you know, uh, let's say introduce a new, new uh, option, they might charge maybe more for, for new uh, modern devices. So do you think uh, customers will, you know, will, will opt for 5G instead of 4G, sir, for example, in, in daily use? So let me tell you what happened here in China. Yes, sir. Um, in China, we had unlimited data packages in 4G. And the operators were really struggling with it because when everybody is offering the same kind of unlimited packages, there's no way to differentiate. And there's no way to grow your revenue. So. When 5G launched here, uh, they sunsetted all those unlimited packages and moved everybody to a speed tiered package. Uh, so if you want a fast connection and a large amount of data, you're going to 5G. If you just want a small amount of data, you can stay at 4G. Um, and that really pushed everybody that was valued their phone to move to a 5G package. It's one of the reasons why so many subscribers here in China have 5G. But from the operator perspective, it also transitioned their high data subscribers to the high efficiency 5G network, which ultimately dropped down their operating cost. 
So going back to your earlier question, is 5G more expensive than 4G? It may be more expensive for the hardware, but it can be more less expensive to operate because you can deliver so much data uh, for just a small increase in power. Yes, sir. But at the same time, you know, we, we talk about 5G and, you know, like uh, the, the core uh, facility that, that support 5G, sir. But at the same time, you know, how about the, the surrounding, let's say, uh, surrounding institutions, sir? For example, you know, when, when you make 5G, you need, you know, for example, a lot more power from the battery. You know, the battery will need more distribution from abroad. Right. And, um, you know, the, the, the battery itself also need more uh, energy from, from, right. the, from the, you know, energy factory. So, uh, basically, sir, like, if we introduce 5G, uh -huh. do we need to introduce the surrounding facility to support 5G in order to make it smooth, sir? Well, in fact, you have a good point, but yes. the wrong example. So, if we introduce 5G radios into the network, remember, those radios are all connected together. That's what we call the backhaul. Now, if I'm able to deliver high speeds to your devices, that data needs to go somewhere. And if I have very low speed backhaul, you're not going to get the benefits. So as you introduce a high speed radio, you also have to introduce a high speed fixed network to connect those radios together and to the services that people want to uh, access. Otherwise, you're not getting the benefit. So many of our customers, when they were deploying 5G uh, many years ago, they didn't start by planning the radio. They started by planning that backhaul network and making sure they had that um, uh, transport capacity to support the data that was going to come over the radio network. Yes, sir. Uh, again, sir, uh, you know, human resource is important. And uh -huh. in Cambodia, we try to you know promote the, the STEM education in order for right. to catch more people into a tech tech industry, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, based on the Chinese example, sir, because China is a leading, let's say, uh, you know, tech nation in the world. So you know, starting let's say from primary school, sir, mm -hmm. how do you you know propose the idea that tech is their career, sir, and and you know like to push them into their their let's say you know their their tech career right. uh, path, sir. So. What has to happen is the jobs have to be there. Uh, it's it's an interesting thing that where the jobs are, the people follow. Um, if you want a career in tech, the training is available online across many, many platforms. Anybody that wants to learn how to program, to operate a network, to operate a server, uh, to build a data farm, all that information is available online and cheap. You don't have to spend a massive amount of money to learn these skills. You just have to spend the time and effort. Now, that said, how many jobs in Cambodia are there available for these kind of offerings? Um, many times we find that the operator assumes there's nobody in their country who can do it, but they're not looking to the universities and they're not reaching out to the universities. When they do that, they find that Huawei's already there and helping promote tech and um, ICT training inside those universities um, and really trying to spread the knowledge of how this technology works and how it can help your country grow and develop. So you said the job is, the, the, uh, there need to be jobs there before the people can, can pursue the job, sir? There has to be jobs there. Yes, sir. Um, and then people will naturally build those skills. Um, we, we strongly believe that um, this technology is evolving so fast um, that it requires an effort of constant learning. And I had this myself. Everything I learned in school within five years was obsolete. Everything I learned the first ten years of my career is already gone. So every five years I have to forget what I knew and learn the new technology. Which means you need five years to catch up with me. That's it. So devote yourself to studying technology and within a couple of years you will have industry-leading knowledge that you can start implementing in the country. Yes, sir. 
But again, sir, you know, because uh, we look at the past and then we try to, you know, make example of the past for the future, sir. Right. You know, before we think of, you know, 2G, 3G and then 4G and then now we are jumping more and more to 5G. Right. And, you know, for, for, for example, for me, you know, 4G is uh, good enough, let's say. So do you think that, you know, maybe in the future, 5G will be an obsolete system compared to 2G sir, before? Uh, more like an idea, sir. So, if you look at the transition, for, especially for mobile phones, yes. there were a couple of major switches. 2G was all about voice. It could only do voice. 3G introduced data, but a very small amount of data. Yes, 4G was our first broadband. It was the first of the mobile services that could provide online video to me. 5G is an expansion of that, but also expend, extending the mobile network into industry. Um, if you look ahead another five to 10 years, 6G is just gonna keep growing that. So if you draw a line between 3G and 4G, those two technologies are gonna sunset. People will turn them off eventually. And from my point of view, it can't be soon enough because the efficiencies you get in 4G and 5G are so much better than what we used to have. And you can do so much more with the technology um, that that's where I would focus everything on. Um, I don't see those technologies disappearing from our lives for another 20 years. Let's say maybe like space industry might depend more on you know those those kind of uh, new equipment. So let's say. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and the real difference between 4G and 5G is just you have access to more bandwidth and can deliver a larger larger amounts of data for less overall cost. Yes, um, so 5G is more efficient than 4G. 6G will be more efficient than 5G. Yes, sir. And so as the amount of data that we're using goes up, the more advanced technology that we need to be using. Yes, sir, but you know, at the same time, do you concern about, you know, when automation is so diverse and, you know, human become, you know, not, not able to work anymore? Is there like that concern or not, sir? So there's not a concern like that for me. Yes, and you see me laughing because you just reminded me of when I was your age. Yes, and I was going into my first job. Oh. Um, I remember that my first boss was basically my age compared to you. And he looked me in the face and said, Brian, I feel bad for you because you were at this age where computers are gonna take over everything. And in 20 years, you're not gonna have a job. Computers are gonna do everything you can do. Um, and I don't know how you're going to earn a living. 20, this was almost 35 years ago. I see. In the past 35 years, do you know how much computers have taken my job away from me? Not much. <laughs> they have taken my job from this level of earning to this level of earning. Okay. So when people tell me that AI and all this stuff is going to take human jobs away, I just keep getting reminded of that scenario because I've heard it before and it did not take human jobs away. What it did is ask the humans to do different tasks and more valuable tasks. So at the lower tiers, the stuff that I hate doing anyway, the computers can have it. I do not like doing the same thing a hundred times over. I would much rather have the script do it. Um, but on the same same time, if there's an interesting project that requires me to think about it, it's more valuable for me, it's more interesting for me, and I'll earn a lot more money. Yes, sir. Well, recently, or maybe in the future, sir, uh, what have Huawei created or renovate, you know, like, you know, that, that produce an impact to the tech industry, sir, and, and what is Huawei hope to achieve in the, in the foreseeable future, sir, let's say? Okay, so one of Huawei's top priorities right now for innovation is looking at how we can drive down uh, the cost of running the network, particularly in terms of energy consumption. Um, so our teams have been going through every single product line and looking for every way we can save every single watt of power. Um, if there's people are not using the network, what can we turn off? And how can we uh, turn them on and off so that the user doesn't perceive an impact on it? That's a technology we call zero bit, zero watts. But going further, how can we also 
look at every aspect of the antenna, whether it's the passive antenna or the radio power, uh, the radio amplifier, uh, and make those as efficient as humanly possible. Um, these are the types of things that Huawei's looking at. Every layer of the network, every element in the network, how can we make them as energy efficient as possible and make sure that the energy consumption aligns with the data that's being delivered. And, yes, sir, and my last question from me, you know, the showroom here, you know, is pack of people, right. a lot of them. So, uh, which industry are they coming from, sir, and, and what is Huawei you know, trying to uh, attract them? Uh, which which uh, industry, sir? Right, so, we are at Mobile World Congress. Yes, sir. Um, most of the people that you see on the floor um, work in the mobile telecommunications industry or the fixed network industry. Um, and this is the market that Huawei serves uh, in the carrier business and ICT business. Um, so uh, what we're looking at, and one of the changes that we're seeing in the mobile industry, however, um, is that all of the network operators are also thinking, I don't want to just deliver mobile services to consumers or to home broadband. They also want to start extending those services to industry. So there's a growing number of industry leaders down there as well, trying to see how this kind of connectivity uh, technology can help them and help their businesses operate more efficiently. Um, so the simple answer, industry executives across many domains, but especially in the communications domain. So thank you, sir, for your insightful answer on uh, the tech advancement here at uh, uh, MWC in Shanghai, China, sir. It's been my pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much.